it's clearly an indication of how much interest this particular project, this particular work and installation has generated in our small Leeds starved community. So we're very, very grateful to Tetley for bringing us this work and very grateful to you for not only giving us the work but being here to talk about it. So I want to first welcome Taishani to Leeds. honoured to be in conversation with you. So, <laughs> so this is going to be a little mutual love. <laughs> anyway, I think we're, we're as honoured and delighted to have you here and I think there'll be lots of people who have questions and thoughts about the work that they want to put. I can see lots and lots of uh, artists present and obviously other visitors to the to, to Tetley. Is, is that not... I want yeah. to keep that a little bit further. Okay, so... Um, We've got a little plan today, which is I'm going to do a bit of an introduction, and then I've got a series of questions, which we're kind of going to go in ever sort of closer circles to get to the work to enable Ty to take us with her through the different processes uh, and deal with the different aspects of what we have upstairs in terms of um, being a major, major artwork which I'm going to say the beginning is a kind of epic, you know, this is a kind of feminist epic of sort of almost operatic in its scale, which is a very uh, rare uh, project of such depth and extension, so we want to talk about it. But um, we've agreed that I'll start because one of the reference points that Ty has given for her work is um, the name of a woman called Christine de Pizan. She really was an Italian, Christine de Pizano. She, her father was an Italian, but he became uh, a doctor, he was a medical doctor, who served the King of France in the late 14th, early 15th century. So she was moved to France and became Francophone, um, as well as obviously probably having uh, Italian. She had to have Italian because one of the sources for her work is the great uh, Italian 15th, 14th century poet Boccaccio. And this is where there's a link with me. So in terms of um, art history, Boccaccio wrote a book based on immense amount of culling from all the sources in the past, the names of famous women. So Boccaccio's of famous women, the um, Mulieribus Claris, is for, was for fe early feminist art historians such as myself, this text which proved, because it provided us the names of artists who were women from classical Greece through to the Roman period and internationally and always all the way up through to the medieval period. So if anybody says to you, I don't think there are any women artists before the 19th century, 20th century, just tell them to read Boccaccio. But of course, the famous women weren't just artists, they were women renowned. And that's a very interesting notion of who gets remembered, who are the women who have been inscribed into Jewish history, into Babylonian and Persian history, into classical Greek and Roman history and ultimately into Christian history. And for what are women renowned once you go through the whole of the Middle East, North Africa, um, if you understand the Mediterranean not as, as it were, the white north, right? We're going to include obviously the North African Egypt and um, Carthage and all these other parts of things. So this was a very, very interestingly inclusive vision of the remembered world obviously didn't have Southern Africa, it didn't have Latin America or the North, North American continent, but it was, as far as a world, not narrow, but extraordinary in terms of the figures who were remembered. And of course, Semiramis is one of these who comes from one of the great um, Euphrates basin empires that, that were much more, um, very long lasting. So, the Christine de Pizan, in 1405 writes this book called Cité des Dames, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that very briefly before I translate, but it is a reply to a very, very misogynist text that was published called the Roman de la Rose, and it reminds us of the recurrent perpetual necessity for women to stand up against this recurring misogyny, and misogyny isn't just that they're a little bit oppressive, they are heinously vicious about the uselessness of women, their danger, their um, moral turpitude, their lasciviousness, their corruption, and the only way to manage them is to keep them silent, 
enclosed and uneducated. So this is not sort of just a generic sort of question of keeping women down. These were active texts proclaiming constantly the wickedness, the dangerousness of women, which are specifically obviously addressed to visions of women's bodies, visions of women's potentiality, and systematically denying this potential for being part of the human race. And it's not just we got better at doing, at being more liberal. There are active periods of gross, systemic, institutionalized misogyny. And it was against this that Christine de Pizau wrote her great book. And three things I want to say about that. One is, it's in three parts. There are 36 famous women in part one, 92 in part two, and 37 in part three. So those of you who can actually do arithmetic, unlike me, will immediately realize there's lots of them, right? <laughs> um, which is an extraordinary thing, which means there is a cultural memory to be recovered in an era, era before books, right? Before the internet, before any form of our usual information retrieval that can mobilize that many <coughs> names of women to counter this generic misogyny, so it's very important. Now, I'll go back just finally, and that was my last bit of kind of lecturiness. I'm sorry about it, it's a professional occupational hazard. <laughs> but cité de dames, now cité is not, doesn't mean it's just a city. So in Latin, if you want to tell something it's a city, it's urbs, <coughs> U-R-B-S. It's people not, they look even Latin people, right? It's excellent, okay? Cité is the, is the contraction of civitas. And civitas, which gives us civil, civic, everything to do with it. It's not to do with being in a city, a town. It's to do with being part of a society. It's the civic, it's the citizen element of it. It is the Latin version of the Greek word polis. And polis does not mean um, political party conferences. It's what happens when people move beyond having just a slave every day to work to, to survive or keep you know, and a kind of uh, everyday life going in the oikos, the economy, they have enough space to think and talk and share and imagine. So they come together. So the polis is the place where you'd have art or poetry or philosophy or decisions about the, the nature of the human world and what kind of society we ought to live in. So she is imagining uh, a civitas, a polis, and of des dames. So they're not des femmes, but they are dam, and dam are like D-A-M-E-S, like dames, which are, as it were, the noble women. Women are of a certain order. So there's a sort of, there's still a sort of medieval aristocratic hierarchy in this, but of course it's, as indeed with Plato, only those who do not have to grind out daily life have the space for this kind of reflection. But she's imagining, therefore, an entire polis, this community, not a community of nuns in seclusion, not a community just of knights running off to war, but where people would ask the most profound questions about the nation, and it would be all women doing it. And she has um, somebody called Lady Virtue is her guide, but she has, and I can't remember these, the three of them without looking up. Rectitude. Rectitude, reason, reason and justice. Now, rectitude, reason, and justice are the very things that are considered women don't have. They are unreasonable, they are mean and unjust, and they are absolutely morally corruptible. So it's very interesting, these three figures that she summons. So I think it's a very, very interesting thing to imagine you beginning to kind of find this text, mm. which is not widely used in the feminist community as a kind of resource, but it is really a kind of massive answer to Plato's Republic right, in the context of this very, very misogynous mm. uh, Christian, uh, medieval Christianity, uh, drawing on this wide vision of women of all of the peoples that represented the known history of the world, not the history of the West of the, of the world. So it seems to be a very interesting th conversation to imagine that you've tried in this particular space to draw on not 92 plus 36 plus 37, etc., but enough 
for us to have this experience. So could you just start maybe by talking about how you came across Christine yeah. de Pisa and how you set this off in your mind? Yeah, I think the, this idea of the epic is really important and I had wanted for a very long time, even before I kind of had any kind of crystallization around the politics or even, you know, a kind of subject matter. I, I always knew that I wanted to make this kind of Gesamtkunstwerk, like a huge work, um, and as my mum says, a, a, a megalomaniac type of work. <laughs> I, I always felt it was an important thing just on, on a very basic level for um, women to do, to, to take space in the world, basically, to make a place, of, which is what the book does as well, it creates a space for women. But I came across it because I was doing some research into uh, medieval mysticism, and someone was like, oh, have you heard about this book? And it was a bittersweet encounter. On one hand, I was I extremely excited about it, but I was a little bit disappointed about some of the things that you mentioned, that it, it still has a very hierarchical kind of structure to it, that, um, you know, a lot of the women, are, are their virtue is uh, signified by their relationship to men, how they help men. So I was... But at the same time, I think that thing of historicity and, and uh, maybe an unrealistic expectation. But because I've been reading all these um, texts by Teresa Vavilla mm -hmm. that are so incredibly um, corporal and psychedelic and experimental, I, I had those kind of expectations for this book as well. Um, so, and also another thing that I found, but there were things about it that I really liked, and I really liked like Semiramis is the first stone that she she builds a city of women, but the blocks themselves are these women. And I quite like that kind of relationship between the material of the city being bodily and also it, it being subjectivities and bodies in a way. Um, so that was what drew me to it. And also I think the characters that I'd been writing before this project often had a slippage between fiction and, and history and and that kind of medieval conception of history it, it's not clear really what what is fiction and or, or everything's accounted for in a non hierarchical <coughs> way in the sense that um, women that are mythological and women that have existed it can coexist in that space so those were I think the main things that attracted me to it but I'd also done several, um, I'd, I'd done um, an adaptation of Antigone before that, and uh, World on a Wire, Fassbinder's World on a Wire. So I, I'd done a few adaptations, and I think they operate for me as a kind of containing structure for these ideas that can be quite sprawling. Like they, they give me some parameters which I find helpful. So I decided to embark on trying to do a mini vet. As I only have 12 characters in, in mind, but a lot of the characters draw on these ideas that are in the book, this kind of conflation between... Like, for example, there's um, um, three characters, I think, that I could say um, are more representative of her type of world, let's say, which is uh, the medieval mystic. So there is a, a medieval mystic that draws on on writings of various medieval mystics and also accounts of anchoresses. Um, there's Phantasmagorgasm, which is a, a writer of Gothic fiction. And there is also Sai Chik and M1, which is also a kind of medium. So th those to me were interesting historical moments where women had a kind of access to um, a public life and self-realization through a supernatural route. So writers of Gothic fiction, um, in, spiritualists uh, in Victorian times and medieval mystics were, were like these anomalies yeah. that kind of came through this strange type of supernatural backdoor in a way onto a public stage and I, I really like, yeah. I, I really want to take that up a little bit mm. because it is very fascinating, the sense of um, how you would put together and since these, well, two things, one is uh, are we policed to think you know that we can only have sort of historical mm. heroines as opposed to the fact that most of us are uh, furnishing our minds and furnishing even our sense of ourselves with 
stories, with images, with performers, with films that we've seen that represent a we all term of character mm. becomes a really interesting term, but it's also one that we're not kind of used to in one sense in the visual arts. It's partly literary or partly cinema. And so maybe that kind of segues into my sort of second area of question, which is um, when you take the kind of this epic vision mm. at, the, at the same time as realizing its limitations and your desire to push it in sort of new, more mm. contemporary feminist directions, how did you conceptualize what it would be, mm. right? Because what we're seeing upstairs is, and I was just thinking, okay, so there are cells in a way, yeah. there are, you know, there's a certain intimacy to go into these rooms and sit sometimes with three skulls, sometimes with one, sometimes completely hidden in a, a VR, sometimes, you know, in, in uh, angled things. So I then think, oh, maybe this is kind of quite interesting using the, the, the screen technology and the size. They become quite sculptural because they all have a certain uprightness and you've remade the notion of a screen by it's not necessarily <coughs> hanging on the wall, right? I mean, they become certain kind of personages mm. in an almost kind of like Louise Bourgeois kind of personages. Mm. They're all of them. And yet at the same time, it isn't quite moving image. Some of them are obviously very much to do with exploring certain kinds of possibilities with the medium, but I am addressed yeah. and I am listening. Yeah. So, could you talk a bit about how you think about this in terms of, not but a medium, but what, what, what are we looking at yeah. as you are conceived? I mean, yeah, I think that the, I, I, I used to make predominantly performance and there's something about um, liveness and um, the voiced text that is incredibly powerful to me as a viewer. Um, and I think that, as you say, like some of the moving image works, I wouldn't, I wouldn't show them in a screening, or yeah, I wouldn't. You know, particularly these kind of long monologue. So some of them are documentations. Some of them are, are addresses. They are declarative pieces of moving image, I guess. But I wanted there to be that uh, face that looks to you, that kind of sense of a connection with. A body, so it's not just hearing or reading the text, and also, I mean, even on a very, um, you know, like, um, cons like, well, on a formal level, I guess, I, I think there's something about the the a person talking to you that you listen to in a different way than reading a text in a gallery, and that's something I've struggled with a lot because a big part of my practice is. The writing, the script, the, the script in its totality is 90 pages. Um, it's quite extensive. I don't really, I never really expected anyone to go through all of, you know, to sit through all of them. But I, I did want this text to be delivered in a way that wasn't here's a pile of papers in a gallery or here is uh, a subtitle. You know, I was really interested in finding a way to kind of conserve some of the urgency. The texts are very, on one hand, like they are this, um, you know, city, but they're also all like very, very confessional and very personal, as well as being um, these more declarative kind of things. So I did want to find a way to conserve that sense of attention and intensity. I'm very interested in intensity. And the uh, that sounded awful. I'm really interested in intensity, um, but I am. I'm very interested in the idea of an, of what happens in an artwork when it is an intense experience, or what happens. You know, that's why I like live work. I think because you do have this kind of you create the conditions for that encounter for the viewer, and those conditions can lead to a very um, focused experience. I, I like that, like to me that's something that's very important. And going back a little bit just to the idea of the epic, because it does relate to that, I think, you know, all the not all the writing, but most of the writing is about erotic love, physical pain, self-consciousness. Um, these are experiences that are kind of on the margins of language for me, in terms, you know, that as a writer, 
they are a challenge that I really enjoy. Like, how do you articulate these? You know, the first text that I wrote, which was the, uh, the adaptation of Bluebeard, I, I was in really intense Lacanian psychoanalysis at the time. And I, I remember, like, the visualisation of some of that, uh, some of the violent, it's a really violent text. And some of the wounds and, like, gashes and feeling really, like, physically sick and, and really wanting to kind of be able to be convincing and somehow to speak truth of extremity, if that makes sense. So this idea then, the epic is similar to that. It, it, it's, it's an affect that I feel is a great kind of platform almost for transformative politics, even though it's, it's, it's not uh, Marxist at all to be affect reliant in that way. But I, I, I do think it's an interesting um, affect to explore these things. So all the work has always, that's been the kind of focal point in terms of thinking of an affect is this epic that's both in terms of the duration of it now but it's, it's something else as well. It's something that, you know, it's a place to dream in a way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so keeping with that way of, of thinking, it's taking it to the, sort of the next kind of area of question, sort of in my little kind of going deeper and deeper into it, it which is um, what is the sort of particular experience of whoever's going to engage with mm. the work? Because... It's obviously articulated in a particular way here. It was, must have been articulated in a different way yeah. in Glasgow, and we've got a documentation of a performance. I mean, I think I I, I love performance work. I, I find it very fascinating because there's always a risk involved. Yeah. Failure, yeah. You know, not just a, a failure, but you know, can the people bear to hear what you're going to say? Yeah. Can you bear to actually say it in, yeah. in these sort of texts? There's a kind of charge yeah. which is not present yeah. in things. I mean, it can be, you can make it very boring or you can find ways to do that. So there's obviously coming out of performance into something now where um, no one is probably going to see all of it, yeah. you know, on that kind of level. Yeah. What is your expectation of what people will take from the fact that between your having the possibility of putting this all in place, what... How do you deal with the fact that people will wander in? You know, what would it be to enable people to say you're going to have to sit and sit through at least one of them fully? Yeah. Because you you don't know when you're arriving, you you don't know where the point to begin. Yeah. I noticed in this in one of the other rooms where you do actually get a credit sequence. Okay, now yeah. hold on to that one because that's about to start again. You know things, but in other cases you've got a. A wandering visitor. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think I've um, uh, cracked it <laughs> in in that sense. I think I don't also expect. I mean, I think there's a register to the work. I hope these are my hopes. Obviously, I don't know. You can all tell me I'm I'm, I'm misguided. Um, but I would like to think that there's a type of register in the work that isn't reliant on, um, you know. I guess more traditional, you know, ideas of where does it begin, where does it end, does it make sense? I mean, you know, like someone said, oh, the characters are all quite similar. It's like, yeah, they they are. Like they're not, you know, they're not, I, I, they're not like uh, expositions on, you know, they're not plot driven. It's very, very uh, nebulous as a space um, in terms of what the text creates. But I, I don't. To me, that's part of the project in a way. It is like, I'd like it to be like entering... OK, I'll tell you what I'd like it to be like. What I'd like, but I really don't think I've cracked it yet. So I don't want to be misinterpreted. I didn't do it this time, but this is the dream. When I was really young, I um, was obsessed with this quite cheesy film called Valmont, which is a mid four-man adaptation of Dangerous Liaisons. And I went to, see, I was 14 at the time, and I went to see it maybe like 15 times in the cinema. I went and went and went and went, like every few days I'd go, and I, it was an absolute obsession. And I'd really miss the kind of, yeah, I don't want to use that word again, but like that immersion 
in the narrative, in the visual and the sound. I missed being there. I longed to go back all the time. And I think somewhere inside me there was a hope that it would be different, you know, that the person that I thought shouldn't die wouldn't die next time. Or I, I wasn't complete. I think I was too young to completely accept, you know, the hard facts that it's a production. It will always begin at the same point and end at the same point. I did want there to be this kind of capitulation into something completely irrational and I'd go and, and you know, he wouldn't die or something would happen differently. And I think that kind of longing and that, com I mean, that's what I'd want. It's like a sense that you want to go back. You want to go back into it. You want to feel more or know more. And also I hope there are, I mean, I think there are experiences there that are, I put myself in a very um, open, vulnerable place that I hope can create a kind of space for solidarity as well in terms of speaking um, about, you know, trespassing into the forbidden or something like that. No, I think that's very fascinating because obviously there's an, a kind of interesting discussion going on in, in a larger world, which maybe just a framework, could, which is to do with the question of that we have lost cinema. I mean, we don't have cinema anymore. There are films, there are cinemas you go to, but they're not cinema in the kind of Godardian sense of what was cinema, you know, what was made up of a certain kind of moment of filmmaking from about you know, the 1940s to the 60s, mm -hmm. of which Milos Forman would one would be, you know, Bresson and all the kind of, you know, God on others, where there was some sense of what this kind of medium could be yeah. that wasn't sort of arty, but it was a deep understanding of something where you have sustained attention, duration, unbelievably finely conceived formal <coughs> yeah. projection in terms of framing and timing and colour and everything to do with you know the, what film stock you used exactly, how deep the blacks would be, all of those sorts of things. So there's a kind of total thing which would catch you in that. Yeah. And of course, of course, the problem of cinema is that um, you can only go home yeah. if somebody that you are prepared to let die dies. Yeah. Right? There's, there's a problem all, you know, in Hollywood they have to get married, but usually, you know, serious, serious film, you have to have let it go by somebody yeah. carrying it off into kind of death. So, so I think that's kind of interesting, whereas now with, with moving image work, we are these this sort of, we are these wandering viewers, you know, that we, we don't, there's nothing that makes you sit down for things. You have to come in and, you know, if you do what I was doing was going round it in the, the last, you know, few visits, etc. people wonder, who is this woman who keeps sitting there, you know, stolidly, you know, <laughs> and then comes back and sits through it again, you know, that that's very bizarre behaviour. And then people would come in and you'd think, well, maybe just because I'm sitting here, they'll begin to get the idea. You just sit and you have to see it through. No, you know, they, they come, oh, do I like it? Do I get, do I get it? No, and on they won. So there's something very curious about soliciting that memory of what it is to be compelled to remain to go back. I did go back to Paradise. Yeah, that's more conventional yeah, film, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. Because I thought, right, you know, but there's something there because yeah, it is but much... that was made for, that I've screened in like more kind of conventional, conventional. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a monologue to camera, but it is it does rely on more kind of familiar cinematic exactly. tropes and yeah it's cut in a certain way it has structure to ish to it mm -hmm. i mean i think like thinking whilst you were talking i was just thinking back on you know like this idea when when i i'm 43 now and when i became an artist um you know the idea of clarity was really at the fore in like the early 2000s you know like one-linery kind of jokes was big, like people loved that stuff at the time. And I think, you know, this idea that, I remember people saying then that, you know, but what is it about? Like, it's not clear. And I think it's about many things. I don't think it's not about anything, but I, I do think that there, I, I don't want to um, adhere, but it's not like a rebellious thing. I'm just not interested, I guess, in that thing of like, you come in, I'm, I'm sure some people will spend like 20 minutes in the in the show, but I don't I don't mind. You see, that's the thing. I don't. It's a project that I've done over four years. I don't really mind mm -hmm. how people want to engage with it in a way. Like I don't have 
you know, if, if people see one, just see the VR piece and they're like, that's, I'm, you know, I'm happy, that's fine. Like, it doesn't, you know, I don't have that kind of expect. like, yeah, I don't need someone to spend five hours in that space, you know, I... I wouldn't. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm a really bad art viewer, though, if that's the thing. I, yeah. I, I whiz through stuff and, you know, so I, I'm aware of it. But, like, to me, as I, I was telling you earlier, I walked out of a crit in my second, first year, second year of art school. I never went back. I never went back to school. I, I really, it was very important for me to do this project in the way that it is. Um, yeah. It was just a really, imp it felt incredibly important to me to do it in that way. Okay, so let, let's push with that one because I think that, that's taking us to the, the next kind of area we want to look at. I, in part, you just made this, I think, really important comment, which is to do with um, the right, in sense, it's not not to make sense, but not to find, to, to meet people's request for, for yeah. clarity. Yeah. Because clarity, is precisely um, impossible in the terms of what you're trying to explore. So let's go back to... I do want to talk about the, the Tetley's yeah. form, but we'll come back to that a bit later. So we were talking a little bit over the, the, the very nice silent we had to sort of get us in this mood um, and ensure that we have enough energy for this, but we did both have salads, so we're kind of terribly <laughs> healthy uh, in this one. But uh, much more kind of interestingly about how this fits in with the sense of what you want to put into the world. So if we, instead of what you want to say, yeah. okay, you're using language in a way which isn't going to produce, that we're going to follow in a linear, yeah. it's not kind of such. So we've engaged the question of, of characters and a certain kind of possibility of um, being in the world or articulating speaking the body that is not going to be a sort of a speech, a formal yep. kind of statement that would come, oh that's what she's talking about but the issue really comes back to the sense of what within the frameworks of this larger framework of, of feminism that, that Christine and Pisa and Leigh allow, so we're not going to be trapped in what do you mean by feminism mm. later about 60s, 70s, 80s etc mm. but this larger country where, what are the issues, what's at stake here mm. in terms of what you've put into the world yeah. for your purposes in this form? Yeah, well I mean formally, like I'll first talk about it a little bit formally because I think there is a relationship between I mean I think, you know if you're looking at like I personally want to start from scratch like I'm happy for you know, to destroy everything and we begin again on really different terms, um, you know, of all types of equality, basically. But I also, you know, so, I mean, the thing is, like, even thinking about what is plot or, I mean, every, all of that is contaminated to a certain degree by years of, you know, white Western patriarchal culture like these you know we can't like our expectations are so fine-tuned to that so it, I mean it would be disingenuous to be like this you know I've carefully structured this to count it isn't like that but it is also an impulse to say this is how I think it should be and there's no reason apart from those expectations that it shouldn't be that way yeah that's it and like interestingly like to me for example, now, which is something I couldn't have done years ago, if I... <coughs> OK, I'm going to bring a pop culture, I'm sorry, but, uh, for example, True Detective Season 2, <laughs> which a lot of people hate, I know, <laughs> but there's many things about it that I think are wonderful, and, like, I think I'm... You can... You know, this idea that things have to be this kind of, like, totality, that everything is accounted for, or that, you know, you can track... You can verbally um, pass on the information of it in, in, a, in a verbatim kind of way, mm -hmm. to me, you know, isn't that interesting anymore? Like, I mean, it, it can be interesting, but it's not interesting for what I want to do. Now, in terms of what I want to hope that this brings in, like, for example, um, the characters, like, for okay, this is one example. So there is, in, in the... Um, various characters, there is this um, thing that gets spoken about quite often, which is um, the, the Eternal Cortex project, 
which is stored on the edge of the hologram or something like that. Um, and it is an aggregate of human experience, basically, or of experience. It doesn't actually specify human. It's, uh, it could be hybrid. It, it just is an aggregate of experience that doesn't create any kind of hierarchies between um, what experience is more important than another. Like So there's any kind of um, encounter, uh, love, um, task would be in there and completely plateaued in a way. So for me, that, is, that, is his, that becomes history in this world. So history isn't like predicated on ideas of conquest or like we then lost this and this happened or then we left the European Union or, you know, there's not, there aren't these kind of um, collective things that are more important. So you could say it's a very atomized maybe idea of what history could be, but it's also like accounting for everybody. It's like everybody's history in this huge, almost infinite database is equal. So that, from, for example, is a kind of conception of history that I think is political. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing, let's say. Okay. <laughs> um, then there's more basic things, like what we were talking about over uh, our lovely salads, which is that when I first started this project about... Well, four years ago was the first iteration, which was at the Hayward Gallery, and it was three characters, but I'd already started thinking about it prior, which is probably about five years now. So when I I first started thinking about it, um, the first text, that text that um, I wrote under um, in psychoanalysis, was for a death metal fanzine that um, is called Buried. And I wanted to really engage with the kind of language of these death metal bands called Gorgasm. And, you know, it's like a kind of uh, catalogue of really heinous, Uh, violent acts, often with a a woman's body as a kind of surface. And at that time, it did feel radical to me to transgress right as a woman about these acts. It felt that there was a place at that time for those kind of expressions of uh, feminism. It felt, you know, it had an urgency at that time. And to inscribe um, the body into culture, to inscribe, to dis other female experiences of bodily experiences into culture. I've shifted, my, my kind of politics have shifted and I'm not as convinced anymore about, you know, like this, I'm more interested now, I guess, in the material ramifications of um, the choices we make than this kind of completely imaginary world, which now I, I like to see more as a kind of strategy as opposed to the thing in itself. So, yeah, those are things that, yeah? Okay, yeah, so let, let's just talk about that a little bit more because mm. I think that's also quite a kind of interesting thing for people to think about, which is going through a certain process in which a kind of overwhelming sense of the need to resist, rather like Christine de Pizan, which is like when you meet such extreme misogyny, there is a necessity to speak back in the kind of totalizing yeah. terms of the misogynist, right? Which is, yeah. you're a woman and therefore you're nothing, to which you speak back, right? Now, from, from my kind of political point of view, which is something I'm kind of exploring and maybe we can just explain, which is that the, the sense that we go beyond <coughs> the generic woman and then we start getting down to kind of finer and finer contradictions and conflicts and almost agonistic sort of tensions around issues to do with ethnic difference, race, racialization, and sexualities, class disproportions, geopolitical disproportions in terms of access to the conditions of life. We end up sort of thinking, you know, you know, there's always a hierarchy, you know, and I mean, I, I gave a paper the weekend, and not this weekend, the weekend before, where there was this classic, you know, if I kind of talked about my interest in the kind of the concentration, somebody said, well, what about the plantations? You know, and I thought, well, this is the classic thing where we start kind of cal- a calculus, yeah. which is an important thing to think about, so I don't disown the calling out the question to me, but at the same time, how do we negotiate this commonly? So you're often, in one sense, a, 
a, a kind of utopian sense, okay, what would it be if you said to people, we have some kind of way in which everything is there and we dispense with these kinds of things. Mm. At the same time, you're also saying that there's a certain process between the grosso modo saying some, that women's experience has to be disothered, and then you say, well, what women am I speaking of? Yeah. What is this? And how do you do it in such a way that it's not more and more antagonisms, yeah. but finer and finer layerings of this complexity? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly, yeah, that's exactly kind of it, is that, you know, from feeling like that these uh, experiences that I began this project with could be universal, you know, I've completely, uh, like, changed my mind about that. I mean, I can, I can, this is uh, not a cop-out, but I can only really write from my experience, really, and I really do not want to, you know, write on behalf of, of experiences that I don't fully understand the nuance of. It's very important to me. Um, to be accountable for the writing that I do. And I think there are lots of areas where, where you know, they're not universal in terms of a totality. I think there are areas where there could be um, moments of solidarity within these experiences, but I, I don't want to speak on behalf of women. Do you see what I mean? That's such a crazy, like, idea. But I do, in the writing, I've tried to keep the... Gen well, it's not the gender, but the, the organs, let's say, are, everything is very, very fluid in the writing. So the um, gender of the person switches and, and the organ switch, you know, there was, there's no fixed point. And also I, I was explicit to not uh, write. The women aren't um, racially defined in a way, but they're also not speaking on behalf I can't speak on behalf of a woman of colour, I can't speak on behalf of a disabled person. I don't feel I have the nuance to do that and or the experience to do that. You know, I just... So, I, I mean, I, I'd like to think that there, there are uh, points in the writing that can offer bonds, but I don't think it, it's um, a, a solution to... You know, that's what I mean. I don't... Like, I, I do... I've been, the project has been amazing for me. I don't know what it can, what it does for the world. As I was saying to you, like you know, I'm sure there are people that maybe are coming to see the work that haven't had heard of a lot of these politics. Maybe maybe for them it is a, a very strong. You know, for me now, I feel like I need to be very uh, careful and considerate about how I, I move forward because I, I do want to. I want to contribute, basically. You know, I want to contribute in a way that is more material than just creating a kind of fantastical space to think of the body in, you know, mm -hmm. or to think of subjectivity or sexuality. And I really want there to be a meaning for this work that could potentially... I, I don't mean this work, this is done now, but I mean for work that can extend beyond the, these rarefied still very white, very privileged spaces, which is the art world. I, I, you know, I want to find a way to transcend that, basically. So I, I am a bit of an impasse. But, you know, what's weird about that is that I've gone completely... Like, now I'm just making sculpture at the moment. I'm just making beautiful, like, objects because it's such a difficult... You know, if, if you are really kind of profoundly honest with the sphere within you work in as an artist... You know, it's a very toxic environment, not in terms just of the personal relationships, but the politics of it are absolutely catastrophic, you know. So, yeah, sorry for that. But, no, no, no. But very brilliant. Okay, I'm, I'm going to ask one more question, and then yeah. we can open it up to, for other people to kind of come at this from different kinds of points of view. Um, I had some kind of... I was very struck, but I wanted to talk a bit about the, 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 the film performances, the performance, which is obviously what happened at Glasgow. Yeah. And in, in those sorts of terms, I had two or three thoughts, which I will share with you very openly, okay, which was, um, they're clearly in, and I can't, I'm sorry, at this stage, the, the, the one, the, where, the central piece, which is, whereas there is a 
of a citation mm -hmm. of the figure of Sachi Bartman, mm -hmm. the woman from Southern Africa, the mm -hmm. Khoisan woman, uh, who is known as Sachi Bartman. I'm sure she had a name of her own that was known only to her and her immediate uh, family and community. But you kind of quoting the sort of sense of displaying this body, and yet she's clothed. So it's a, a, a woman of colour, but she's clothed in um, elastic underwear of a yeah. certain kind, which is sort of body coloured. And then you've got um, other women. Are you talking are, about the one where she's spinning? Oh, she's, yeah, she's yeah. turning, etc. Yeah. She, she moves, she's in different places and different performances, but she, yeah. she's on the kind of turntable. Which she's, is she's actually a piece of software. Okay, see, so she's a piece of software. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that, well, that's interesting because in okay. terms of the, the casting, uh, you, you know, like that's what's kind of um, was one of the interesting parts about delivering this project in the real world um, was, you know, in your head, you're like, no one has a gender, no one is, you know, like everything's kind of quite fluid, but then when you have to have people, um, representing these characters. So it was very important to me that the cast was diverse, um, that it wasn't um, just cis women, that it wasn't just young women, that it wasn't white. Um, and also in terms of the, these very nebulous characters that, you know, there's not much between them really. <coughs> But I did want to, I was very, very specific with who I cast for what character because I wanted, so the woman on the edge of time it, it was um, uh, represented by Jo, but she, she's a 70-year-old a, a trans woman. Um, so I did think very carefully about what who the characters were and the medieval mystic was... Um, Hannah, who was a woman of colour, I wanted to make sure that it, there was a reason why I chose each person to be in the role. So um, Toby, who was um, the nemesoid character, they played that role throughout. So everyone played the roles, they, everyone played the same role, even though in a lot of the episodes they didn't do anything, if that makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have known that they are... A, a specific character, but that um, the nemesoid character is a piece of software that um, connects that that database that I was telling you about earlier. Um, it's a piece of software that does these simulations of experiences that are really on the margins of, of language. So all the experiences that um, their character were kind of talking about. One was based on Christina the Astonishing being eaten by dogs. Um, one was, don't hate me, there's a William Burroughs reference in it, but it, one of them was uh, an encounter with William Burroughs and his cat, and him saying, when you cut into the present, the future leaks out. Um, one was like, pers you know, so, so there were like all these experiences, so, so they were this kind of immaterial character, but also a, a very extreme future-type character as well. Mm -hmm. And one final thought which is, was just going through my head, which is, insofar as you are the kind of orchestrator and writer and inventor and creative characters, can, got, can, when you, can we not have a certain kind of um, <coughs> escape from our own specificities at the point at which we, we write or we invent. I mean, that's a, it's a big kind of ethical question. So you're, you're making the position that you, you can't think outside your yeah. experience, and yet at the same time, the very possibility of solidarity or transformation involves us in some either politically motivated or empathic capacity yeah. to say, someone else's experience is not mine, or I am even a blot in somebody else's yeah. experience. I'm a, a black, you know, a white light in a sort of, you know, a world that does not want that. You know, the, the, not being a white light is a good thing, but being a kind of like blot on the landscape is a mm. different sort. But I mean, that the, this capacity to have a certain kind of transitivity isn't that crucial for us in the sense to to produce the kind of utopic yeah. gesture. But I think for me, like. 
having, I mean, empathy and solidarity are words that are extremely overused, but like the, let's say, the core idea of, of creating a space for solidarity is by nature transient. It's not a space that is fixed in time or space. And also, I don't think that that negate, I think solid, um, empathy doesn't negate like a recognition of one's own um, kind of field in a way, or where, how one encounters the world. And, you know, I think there are um, specific, like I'm not so interested in the kind of, you know, anecdotal, like, oh, but this person is this, but you don't know if this white person is rich or not, or you don't know what life they had. I'm talking about a kind of baseline um, interface with a world where your where, where oppression is targeted at you because of something completely visible. Like that, those are the things that I'm interested in. And to me, I, I, I don't know that I, I haven't encountered that. And that I mean, I'm a fat woman. I encounter uh, you know prejudice around fat women and misogyny around that. And I have throughout my life. But it, you know, that's a specific thing that when I can, I feel I can have some kind of authority to talk about. But I don't feel I can do that for. Um, but I don't think that it's not binary to me. It doesn't mean that you can't be empathetic to that. I don't think it doesn't mean that you can't have bonds of solidarity. I think that they are limited in terms of unless you recognize your um, position and privileges, they are limit, you know they are limited these bonds. You know you don't have the same experiences ultimately. Hmm. A very good point to open up because we what we've I think we've in a sense, gone from something of the kind of the epic, you know, chokic, yeah. sort of, um, you, you use the word Wagnerian kind of frame of this project to begin to speak about how the very act of working with characters yeah. and scripts has transformed the very politics on which it was yeah. based by means of some aspects of the aesthetics yeah. on which you practiced yeah. to now thinking. Yeah, but I mean, Beyond. someone like Octavia Butler, you know, there are lots of writers that, um, a lot of feminist writers have used this kind of, the unboundedness of science fiction to be extremely political in. So I, I do think that creating a space for imagining is really important. But I don't feel that in terms of the characters that I've written, you know, the, but also if, if I was to like do a kind of, um, how do you say it, like an a inventory of things that are, are spoken about. You know, a lot of them do have um, a, a broad kind of... Um, they're very interior. They're very much about, like, I guess, you know, human condition um, or... or fem I mean, but, that you know, that's part of the project was, like, not creating a world where, like, experiences that would have been traditionally thought of as feminine are not othered anymore. You know, that's part of the project is that it's a totality... So these experiences exist within that on a very kind of level mm -hmm. that they wouldn't out in our world, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Okay, I think it's time to perhaps open it up for other people to ask the questions that they may have from having seen the work or maybe made some comments. Um, some, some people here have seen it in Glasgow, I know, as well. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of, that's what, that was one I was kind of interested in, how it translates and how you've actually used the Tetley is a really, really interesting, um, its little cubby holes become kind of quite an interesting uh, framework for it. So, um, I really, really enjoyed the exhibition, so thank you so much. Um, but I would love to hear more about how the, your process of writing, because as I was in the exhibition, the words that you used, listening to that was, was um, a really immersive experience, as you kind of were talking about. So, how, like, how did you how did you bring it all together mm. and write it? Um, well, it's going to be published as a book as well. So, just thinking about what how I uh, define that kind of writing, I've called, I think they're calling it um, a book of science fiction, feminist prose, or something like that. Um, I think like the language is very dense and very floral, and again, it, it's thinking about this idea of the epic. So I, I think I was I've consistently chosen words that the kind of affective uh, weight 
is very heavy, if that makes sense. Um, and the process of writing, yes, yeah, so it started, okay, well, basically, the, um, a lot of this, the kind of more anecdote stuff that happens in it is, is personal stuff. Like, um, and I think uh, there, was, uh, there have been a few key points in the different texts, like in Paradise, where something is said in very plain language, that I, I struggled to say like throughout my life, let's say, and then it just exists on a page, and it's it, it's not a metaphor. Like a lot of it is not metaphorical, I guess, in a way. A lot of the experiences are, are drawn from, yeah, quite a kind of uh, personal history or things like that. Um, and what I was saying about that going being in analysis, like that, really kind of helped. I find writing hard, that's so hard. Um, it's also the most rewarding thing, but it's really, really, really... Uh, like, it takes me a long time. I'm not a prolific writer. That took me four years, like 90 pages. And afterwards, I feel not very good as well when I finish, like, bouts of it. So, uh, yeah, it's not, like, the best thing for mental health for me as well quite tra- like so yeah a lot of it is quite traumatic stuff so it's quite difficult to also like revisit in a way um but i i don't want it to be seen as a kind of it wasn't my therapy like i've been in therapy as well um so it's not like a, a kind of therapeutic writing but it's definitely um i looked a lot at these writers like um Teresa Vavila and also at the time when I began writing, I was really interested in Helen Cizou's idea of écriture féminine and like writing from, you know, kind of uh, inscribing women into the world. So a lot of that, that kind of writing. But you know what's interesting is like looking at um, these kind of medieval texts and then thinking of écriture féminine. They are like they are that. That's what they are. So I think that was the kind of sphere that I wanted the writing to happen in, really. Um, but I don't have a method, method. It's chaos and pain. Uh, can, so, yeah. can you say just a bit? Because people may not know what Lacanian psychoanalysis is, but this is yeah. so much connected with language, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, I mean, actually, weirdly, they don't say very much. Well, that's right. That's yeah. Good they uh, <laughs> good they do. They they say nothing. They don't make eye contact. It's really it's quite brutal. I don't really recommend it. And they also choose the length of the session so you go um and like i'd cycle across london get there and then five minutes afterwards you'd be like it's not the pornography we are done for today and i'd be like okay uh, <laughs> and that was it so i i, I yeah i I, fa- I mean i found it like it was very you talk basically you're just talking 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 and then um there's often something that's said that like leaves you in a kind of space to think about what you'd spoken about i guess but i i didn't find it great i have to say i think that piece of really violent writing was probably the best thing that came out of it i, I stopped after not too long yeah, okay. I, I mean, I found it interesting as a process. Like, I'd like to watch a film about it. But actually, like, sitting in a room with someone looking at your bag, not making eye contact, you know, I found it too much. It's like, yeah. I mean, I, I want, you know, like, because you perform in analysis, you're performing um, and be, someone being analysed, basically. So, like, when you're met with this real, like, <laughs> someone who doesn't, like, kind of um, acknowledge... Yes, I guess it's about breaking down the ego and stuff, but I think acid's better for that personally. <laughs> <laughs> Another question: Are you are you stretching or qu- or asking a question? That, that was a stretch, but I can ask a question. Yeah, that's Would good. Would you like to? Um, that would be lovely. I, uh, I'm really interested in this like iterative way of working, is that because you're not necessarily doing it in the way that you, you make this kind of work? No, it, it was, it was, I mean, like, on a more kind of, uh, I don't know what I call that, like, career, real life career. No one wanted to do this project, basically, at all. Um, and I had hundreds of, like, literally hundreds of meetings until Bryony was, um, we had a meeting about it, and then when you 
came here and you offered me a show and I was like, I obviously want to do that thing that we talked about two years ago and, and I have to say was really instrumental. So in, um, I know it's not supposed to be a love fest for you, but you know, like we, Bryony came with me for meetings all over the country with people to, you know, see if they would be interested in doing this. So it had to be iterative as well, but also like once I did like my head is so so chaos and my, my uh, attention span is so like bad that thinking oh there's this kind of structure the city of women book 12 you know you can make characters so then every opportunity that I had let's say over the years it's like little bits of it have been in loads of different things so you know I do let's say someone would be like, oh, do you want to do a performance? I'd be like, oh, yeah, I'll write a character for that, and that would be a new character. So it's a really, like, I think just uh, as uh, someone who teaches, as I, t I teach at the RCA, um, thinking it's a really useful thing to be like, even if you don't, no one knows what it is, but to kind of in create a framework that's quite vast that you can then inhabit is really, really, really useful, like just in terms of, you know, instead of being like, I've written about a vampire, I don't know what, uh, you know, it's like, oh yeah, this is a vampire, it's one of the characters, you know, it's one of, <laughs> so it was quite a, a, a good way to make work for me, um, and like the Nemesoid character was written, Serpentine had a show about Hilmath Klimt, and they asked me to re respond to it um, and curate a day that was called Mysterical. <laughs> Like yeah. hysterical, but mis 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 mystical as well. Um, it was it's weird because it was it was like a fake name, it, just like a joke. And then I saw it on the um, leaflet. Yeah, and I was like, oh shit, okay. <laughs> um, but for that, I wrote the Nemesoid character, and and for that character, it was um, an actress read it to camera, and there was a live feed projected on a monolith that I built. So. Then I used that thing of the live feed in, in Glasgow, the narrator read to camera, but there was a, um, uh, what do you call it, a monitor with, with her face. So it was mediated and live as well. And I quite liked that kind of strange, yeah, little loop of seeing something live, but seeing it happen mediated as well. So the iterative thing was just useful. It was also like the only one, you know, like by the time I applied to Arts Council to get the big money. I had like eight characters already. So, you know, also gave um, people that were like, you're never gonna, well, it first started as a Roman orgy that had uh, 29 real people and 29 uh, body, silicone dummy body doubles. That I tried pushing that for two years and people were like, no, no, no. Um, and then it became this. So like, it just meant that I could be like, look, I've done all these characters already. They've been at all these places. It, it can work. Like, you can trust me. <laughs> you can believe me. Yeah, give me the money. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, I don't really know much about your background. You mentioned about that you've been to a crit and then you just walked out of our school. Yeah. Never to sort of go back. Yeah. How did you end up finding your way into the art world and, and becoming a successful artist? In, what path did that take? Um, that I'm still very poor, by the way, so success is uh, very... Um, I, grew up, I grew up in a commune in Goa um, with really kind of hardcore, hippie, intellectual, druggy people. Um, very gay. Like not, uh, It was a house with my parents, his, my dad's third wife, and lots of gay men that were very flamboyant. Um, so I had a problem with authority from I, I didn't I couldn't read or write when I was ten basically. So as soon as I we we moved to Europe and I had to go into an educational system, it was like shit from day one. Like I didn't get on with it at all. Um, so I think that I just have a very bad relationship with authority. So when I went to art school and people were like. I, I, it was a, a fight about like some really stupid thing. I can't remember even. But I, I just I couldn't accept that someone would know better about what I do than myself. <laughs> um, and then I was 
my, my, I, I'm Jewish, my parents were living in Israel and I, I obviously did not want, well not obviously, but obviously to me, did not want to live there and came to London. I was born here, so I had a passport and I just was tenacious as a, a terrier dog. <laughs> they say they're quite tenacious, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was like that. I, 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 but it's a very different world now, that's the thing. Like when I came to London, there were loads and loads and loads of amazing artist run spaces that you could just be like, hey, um, I've made some videos of kids singing punk songs in the forest, which was true. And then they'd be like, oh yeah, let's, let me see your VHS. And you'd show it to them. And then that would be, you know, that could be enough to be, I actually called, this is true, when I arrived in London, I made a list of all the galleries. I called the White Cube. I was like, hello, my name is Taishani, I'm an artist. Can I show you my work? <laughs> and they were like, uh, they didn't even know how to respond, literally. They were like, they've never had a phone call like that, so they were like, oh, uh, send a self-addressed envelope, I guess. And, and so I called like maybe 20, it sounds like one of these kind of American, um, you know, like stories. Like, I called and, you know, find me someone said, like, come, come in. It was a place called the Horse Hospital, actually. Mm -hmm. And then I ran that space afterwards for 12 years, and they were like, come on in, come in. And they showed, like, these films with the kids singing punk songs. <laughs> and then, it, but it was different, it was different then. Like, there wasn't, like, not having an MA wasn't like, I mean, it was frowned upon, but it wasn't like this thing now that it's like an impossibility to imagine a you different way. Is, yeah. Sorry? You feel it is an impossibility? No, I, I don't. I don't. I mean, I think that artists have to organise more and take back some power because there's so many jobs now that rely on this production of art that they get salaries, they get paid. Artists don't get paid. They don't get paid for what they do. Their remuneration for what they do is minimal. There's so many artists that also, that you know, no one cares if you pull out of a show or don't pull out of a show. It's really, you know, I think something has to shift. It's like you can't just be the line of production, you know? Like, I, I think artists have to kind of find a way back to create other ways of doing things. It, it's quite depressing now, I find, how things are. I mean, it's, it's, it's not for me because I've reached a point that I can make the work I want to make. But if I was younger now, I don't know what I'd do, to be honest. Can I just clarify? <laughs> I just, I know, I want to, but can I just clarify the sense? Are you saying this, that it's the question of who's controlling the f flow? I mean, so the people who, I mean, is it curators? Is it the institutions that are sort of having the power and they take the money and you don't get it? Or is it that artists have to be qualified? You only have to have an MA and a PhD, and then you get. It, it's a mixture of all things, but it's also the fact that, like, for example, being. Um, you know, like it's a square, conservative place now. Do you know right. what I mean? The art world, it's yeah. very conservative. It is actually like quite, I mean, I, you know, the more money there is, where, and all this money comes from like the worst place, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it, yeah, it, yeah, that's right. yeah. And then let's say if you're in an exhibition and you go over budget, it comes out of your fee. You know, that do, do people that are doing uh, the marketing chip in, do you know what I mean? It's like the kind of precarity, the financial precarity of being an artist is completely burdened on the artist. And in terms of all these people that invest some, like, you know, fees to go to university, so exorbitant and so exclusive, it's who, who can afford to do this now? You know, unless you have, like, the backing of a family that can help you, like, how can you do it now? You know, you're not paid. It costs a fortune to do. Well, I always had the theory that of all the, the, the um, pr um, disciplines or, you know, possible degrees that would be least affected by fees, it would be fine art. Because either you think you're going to be Damien Hurst and then it won't, it won't matter, yeah. or you'll be so poor you'll never have to pay your your yeah. the fees back, yeah. because you'll never get to that level. Yeah. Or if you do, it will be relatively yeah. small. So it, it was, you know, it's kind of best education you can get because it's going to be free. Yeah. So I mean, it does seem to have some level of truth to it. 
on the other hand, but it is based on that one. But the other thing I think, just which I think is about this a general question, which is I think we underestimate, and I've just been part of what I've been doing this summer, the, the degree of financialization yeah. of art to the extent that, like one of the figures that is, which is that you know, there's something like eight million artworks in the Geneva duty-free storage, which will never see the light of day. Yeah. And once you financialize art to that point, it's one of the points that Hito Stahl makes, any attempt for us to expand the inclusiveness is yeah. lost because finance will dictate the continuing, you know, the great white masters yeah. of a sort who will be the sort of absolute gold ship investments. Yeah. And there are certain selected ones. But the whole, as you say, the, the structure of supporting artistic activity, and even as we know from lots of research that's been done in organizations in Leeds about this question of where are the artist led spaces and where, and they, yeah. they are always in negotiation. But they also all want to kind of upgrade to being, you know, like, not that, in a way. It's like it starts as an artist-led space, and then it's like, well, yeah, we've got, we're in whatever the, like, cool bit of freezes, or, do you know what I mean? It's like, it, it's not an end anymore. You know, there used to be, I mean, I, I'm not like someone who, I, I quite like the future, and I have, very, like, even though we're in very difficult times, I've got very positive um I think, you know, that there's amazing potential for things to change now. But I do think that that thing of, like, how difficult it is to do something that isn't completely sanctioned and supported now is really bad. This your question, and then I'll come to you. Okay. Hi, yeah, I just, um, was interested what you were saying about... Um, <coughs> I'm going to after. <laughs> thinking about it for a while. Um, that kind of um, atomized uh, history of human experience, and then the intensity of um, like cinema. And I guess you know, I can't really ask a question because I've only seen the work very briefly in Glasgow when I arrived just before the gallery was closing. <laughs> but that was due to material circumstance, which is also kind of interesting. And it's always I only just arrived here in time and things like that. And so I wonder if you could say some more about um, just thinking around how. Kind of people experience culture and work like this and then how it maybe fits into their wider experience um, and as well as a kind of when you think about feminist ethics and things like that and how that maybe it's like slips into someone's lifelong experience mm -hmm. i don't know if you had any more thoughts on that um i mean i okay well i don't know if it's completely answers your um kind of question but it I think, you know, like thinking about, okay, so what is, you know, if, if let's say I'm preoccupied with this idea of, let's say, if you, if you flatten hierarchy completely, how do you then, you know, what narratives do you draw and on, on what kind of um, systems of power, even if they've changed, do those narratives, how are, you know, are formed along that is coherent. So, you know, if you said, let's say, what would be a museum in this utopian space, for example, um, why would you choose certain artworks and not others? Why would you choose, you know, even if you chose to address um, the underrepresentation of women and people of colour and, and non-binary people, you'd still be, cho you know, you choose certain artworks still as representative. So why you know why why certain things come up and, and others don't? So that's something that I think like in terms of this his collective history, or like if if you say um, history is a collection of like atomized experiences, but there are historical moments that affect big groups of people. Um, 